Molecular geometry is the topic of this lesson, and we'll start off with a little bit of what's called Vesper Theory, uh, and we'll move on and talk about how the electron groups around an atom try to spread out as far apart as possible to minimize those repulsions, and we'll talk about both electron domain geometries as well as molecular geometries, so as well as how you distinguish between the two. This lesson is part of my high school chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss a lesson, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so before we get into the actual shapes and stuff like that, we just got to talk about what's called Vesper Theory. I know it looks like Vesper Theory, so but that just sounds weird, so we call it Vesper Theory. But this stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. And what this really means is that when you look at the electron groups around an atom, well, electrons being negatively charged, they all repel each other, and they want to spread out as far apart as possible. And when they do, they minimize their repulsions. The closer they are together, they'd have greater repulsions, and that would be considered a higher energy state. But when you spread them out as far apart as possible, you get this lowest possible energy state. And it turns out that's the shapes the molecules actually adopt. So if you look, uh, we first got to talk about what's an, uh, termed an electron domain. An electron domain is either a non-bonding pair of electrons or it's an atom bonded to the central atom. And it turns out it doesn't matter if it's a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond, that one atom bonded to the central atom would be considered one of its electron domains. So either a non-bonding pair of electrons or an atom it is bonded to. All right, so if we look, if we want to spread these electron groups, these electron domains as far apart as possible, we got to know three fundamental shapes. And so the first question would be, what would be the farthest apart you could spread two things around that central atom? And it turns out it would be exactly 180 degrees. And so all three of your atoms, the central one and the two it's bonded to, would be aligned in a straight line. And so the shape here would be called linear, and the angles between, if they were bonds anyways, would be 180 degrees. So that's the first fundamental shape. Now what about three things? So three things are going to spread out. It turns out it's still a two-dimensional structure. So and in this case, a two-dimensional structure means it's a planar structure, fits in a single plane. And you're just going to have those three groups spread to the three corners of an equilateral triangle. So I've got a little tiny model right here. So three corners of an equilateral triangle, and they'd all be 120 degrees apart. And because it's a planar structure, we label it a planar structure in the name. And because it's to the three corners of a triangle, we call it trigonal planar. All right. So that's three electron domains, and then finally four electron domains. So it turns out with four electron domains, it ends up being a three-dimensional shape. They can spread out farther going into three dimensions than they could if they just went into two dimensions. Obviously, if they went into two dimensions, you'd just end up with like a central atom, and it would be bonded to four things. And these would all be 90 degrees apart if it was a two-dimensional world. Well, it turns out if we actually rotate this, we can put two of these in one plane and then two of them in another plane, and it spreads it out just a little bit. And I've got another model here. And it's a three-dimensional shape. It's not planar, so it fits, uh, does not fit into a single plane. So being a three-dimensional shape here, they can spread out a little bit bigger than 90 degrees. It turns out they can split it out to 109.5 degrees. And we call this shape tetrahedral. So in tetra means four, hedral means faces, and you've got a triangular face with these three, you've got a triangular face with these three, turn it one more time, you've got a triangular face with these three, and then a triangular face with the bottom. And so there's four triangular faces on this shape, if you will, and that's where it gets the name tetrahedral. So these are your three fundamental uh, electron domain geometry. So when you get to uh, taking a college chemistry course or an AP high school chemistry course will probably teach you about five electron domains and six electron domains. And, uh, and if you decide to major in chemistry uh, uh, in your, as a senior, you might take an advanced inorganic chemistry class. And we might even teach you about uh, more electron domains than that. But suffice it, your typical high school class is only going to talk about two, three, or four electron domains. And so that's what we are going to restrict ourselves to talking about in this lesson. Cool. So these are your electron domain geometries, your three fundamental geometries. But you'll see that in Vesper theory, we actually look and define what's also known not only as your electron domain geometry, but your molecular geometry. And in a, some cases, we'll find out they're the same. And in other cases, we'll find out that they're definitely different. And we'll see how you predict which. All right, so now we're going to dive into molecular geometry. And we first got to understand just why is molecular geometry different than electron domain geometry. Well, it turns out that if every single one of your electron domains is an atom, 
well, then it's actually not different. So like we see with these first three examples here, so here carbon's bonded to two atoms, so two bonding domains, we say, and it doesn't have any lone pairs, so no non-bonding domains. And if both your domains are bonding, then your molecular here is also going to be called linear. And so when the central atom doesn't have any lone pairs of electrons, as is the case here, here, and here, it turns out your molecular geometry has exactly the same name as your electron domain geometry. And so with two bonding domains, linear, three bonding domains, trigonal planar, four bonding domains, tetrahedral. So no difference there. The key difference comes in when your central atom has lone pairs of electrons, as is the case in each one of these three examples. All of a sudden now, the electron domain geometry is still going to have the same name it always did. With three domains total here, it's still going to be called trigonal planar for the electron domain geometry, but the molecular geometry is going to get a new name. Same thing down here. Both of these have four total electron domains, either three atoms and one lone pair, or two atoms and two lone pairs, and their electron domain geometries are still going to be called tetrahedral but their molecular geometries are going to get a new name. And the way this works is when we're actually looking at molecular geometry, we don't actually look at all the electron domains, we only look at the atoms. And so the lone pairs are in this sense invisible in this context, because we're only actually looking at where the atoms are related to each other. And so as a result, things are going to be a little bit different. So if we look at SO2 here, SO2 has three electron domains, and I probably should draw in those lone pairs on the oxygens. So, but the central atom is the sulfur. It's got three electron domains. Electron domain geometry is still called trigonal planar. However, the lone pair is invisible. And so if we look at these three atoms, so how are they related? Well, when you've got three atoms, you only have two options. Either those three atoms are arranged in a straight line, like they were up here in carbon dioxide, or they're not. And if they're in a straight line, we call it linear. And if they're not in a straight line, we call it bent. Well, these two are roughly 120 degrees apart. And so they're not 180, so it's not linear. And so we simply call this shape bent. Cool, so that's the way that goes. Now, if we look at this example down here as well, I'm gonna skip over to this one. With four electron domains, two lone pairs, two atoms. If you notice, it also has a total of three atoms. And again, if three atoms, they're either arranged in a straight line and it's linear, or they're not, and it's bent. And Mr. Lewis, unfortunately, makes everything look like it's either 90 degrees apart or 180 degrees apart. But we have to realize that that's not the case right here. They look 180 according to Mr. Lewis's diagram. However, we gotta realize that the bond angles for something that is a, a tetrahedral electron domain geometry with four electron domains, those angles are actually roughly 109.5. If we were to actually try and draw the shape of this, a water molecule here would look like so. And this angle right here would be approximately 109.5 degrees. We'll find out it's actually a little bit less in a little bit. So, but approximately the same shape as the tetra, or same angle as the tetrahedral electron domain geometry here. So, uh, but in this case, again, with it being three atoms, it's either linear or it's bent and it ain't, it ain't linear. So this also gets the same molecular geometry name of bent there. And then we've got one more to memorize here. And in this case, when you've got four total domains and one of them is a lone pair. So again, the angle between any of these hydrogens, these bond to hydrogens, is roughly 109.5 based on that tetrahedral shape once again. So however, that lone pair is invisible. And so if you actually look at what this molecule looks like, kind of try and draw this a little bit differently here. So we'll draw one here, one kind of coming out front and I'll draw it big and then one kind of going back behind and I'll draw it small. And what you find is that those three H's form a triangle and then go up to kind of a truncated pyramid up to the nitrogen. And so it's a, a triangle based pyramid up to that nitrogen. In fact, we should draw that in. So, but this thing's a little bit truncated because had it had a hydrogen up here, it would be a pyramid that would look like the tetrahedron, where it's equal in every single dimension. But this is not going to be equal in every single dimension. It's going to be a little bit of a, a flattened pyramid, if you will, uh, because it doesn't have that fourth electron domain to make it a full height pyramid up to, up to here, if you will. Uh, and so as a result, we can't call it tetrahedral, but it is a triangle-based pyramid. And being a triangle-based pyramid, we'll call it trigonal but not planar, because it's not planar, it's three-dimensional. And being a triangle-based pyramid, we'll call it trigonal pyramidal. Or some people say trigonal pyramidal. I 
personally have heard it both ways by so many different professors, I couldn't tell you which one is correct or if one's more than the other. But whether you say trigonal pyramidal or trigonal pyramidal, it spells it right either way. And these are the fundamental molecular geometries you've got to be able to understand. Now, it turns out we're not teaching you anything in a high school class uh, about five or six electron domains. It turns out there's a whole bunch more. We could uh, really quickly double the number of molecular geometries you'd be on the hook for, but we don't teach those in a typical high school class. Now, if you take AP chemistry or college general chemistry, you're definitely going to learn those five and six electron domains. But here, this is it. But you definitely need to memorize these molecular geometries. And given any particular molecule, you need to be able to predict both its electron domain geometry and its molecular geometry, as well as its bond angles. And one quick note about those bond angles, um, the effect of lone pairs on the central atom always reduces those bond angles ever so slightly. So if we look at the, ang like the angle between any two bonds in methane here, CH4, that bond angle is going to be exactly 109.5 degrees. But it turns out the angle between any two of the nitrogen hydrogen bonds here this actually gets shortened down to 107 degrees. It turns out the repulsion from the lone pair of electrons to these bonds is bigger than the repulsion between the bonds themselves. And as a result, they get scrunched down just a couple of degrees. You don't have to know this 107 degrees, but you should be able to look at this molecule and be like, the angles are close to 109.5, but technically the bond angles, the angle between the bonds will be just slightly lower than 109.5. So, and again, I don't expect you to know that it's exactly 107, but when I say slightly lower, I mean like two degrees, two and a half in this case, not 20 degrees. All right. So same thing when we take a look at water here, and notice I said that the angles were approximately 109.5 in water. Well, the truth is it shrinks it down another two and a half degrees. And so the actual bond angle here in water is actually 104.5 degrees. So it shrinks it down a couple more. So with two lone pairs, again, the repulsion between these lone pairs and the bonds and stuff is greater than the repulsion between the electrons and the bonds themselves. And so this gets shrunk down even a little bit smaller. And again, the exact number is not so important, but the big take home is that lone pairs on the central atom are gonna shrink that bond angle down just a couple of degrees. Cool, now we've got a representative of every single one of our molecular geometries. And so given any particular uh, Lewis structure, you should be able to determine both its electron domain geometry again, its molecular geometry, its bond angles, so on and so forth. If you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to help support the channel. And if you're looking for the study guide that goes with this, or if you're looking for practice problems, check out my premium high school chemistry course on chadsprep.com.